Well, good morning, everybody. And good morning to everyone out on our digital campus this morning. Welcome to worship. So today is the second Sunday in Advent. And uh, this is also Communion Sunday as well. So because of all the coughing and whatnot, we're using the the uh, little communion packs. If you don't have one, you want to pick one up at the back of the sanctuary uh, for communion today. Let's get ourselves centered. So we have found our feet. We have found our seats. Let us take in one deep breath and hold and breathe out. And then we will take in another breath of life and hold and breathe out. And then one last breath of the Holy Spirit, bringing it into our bodies hold and breathe out as we go in to worship. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse 
shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. We are the followers of that root of Jesse Isaiah spoke of. We are the ones who are now called to stand as a signal to the world, to all of creation, that peace is the will of the one who created us. Peace is the knowledge of the Lord that we proclaim from sea to shining sea. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, and bear fruit worthy of repentance. We light these candles, the candle of joyful hope and the candle of proclaimed peace, in part to remind ourselves that we are people rising towards God's promise. But we also light them as a sign to the world, an announcement that there are some who hold on to hope and there are some who work the ways of peace. We stand as a sign that Emmanuel is still our fervent prayer. Please stand and join and sing together our opening song, Come the Long Expected Jesus. Christ our Lord invites to his table all the Yes, just like your Xbox mic. All right, so let's try this again. Christ our Lord invites to the table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, all are welcomed. All are welcomed. The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, eternity, creator of the universe. Through your word and spirit, you are one, and we worship you. Your word initiated all that we see and declared it all good. Through your breath, we received our being. When we fell into sin and spiritual death, you did not abandon us. Through your covenant with your people, Israel, and through prophets and teachers, you stayed in relationship with us. In Jesus, your very word took on flesh and dwelt, taught, healed, suffered, and died among us and for our salvation. Through Jesus, we have the fullness of grace and truth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Well, we have a lot of things going on in our community over the next week or so, because it's Christmas time, and we are committed this year to being unabashedly Christmassy, regardless of what other people in the country may say. We're going to celebrate Jesus. Community, connection point. There will be breakfast with Santa this Saturday, December 10th, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. We do need volunteers still to help cook pancakes and sausages and to help host the community. We have invited the greater Bloomington community to come. So this is our first event where we've invited the community. We don't really know how many people are going to show up. So again, it's always better to have more than not enough. So please direct any questions to Katie in the main office, or you can sign up on the bulletin board across from the main office. All right, so we reached out to the conference, and because the conference was not changing from 22 to 23, a vote was required, so we, were supposed, we submitted our minutes. Unfortunately, the conference said, yet. And so we have to re-vote on it because I have to, my, my pay has to be in line with what the conference said. Um, the conference has a minimum scale and apparently I wasn't meeting the minimum scale. Uh, so we will have to re-vote about it. We will put out an announcement about it. You'll have all the information regarding it. We didn't do anything wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. We just got different information from the annual conference. And when it comes to annual conference, love the annual conference, but sometimes they make things around here exciting. Christmas Eve service is Saturday, December 24th at 4 p.m. You are either required to wear your Christmas pajamas, which depending upon the temperature could be quite the experience, within reason, <laughs> or your ugly Christmas sweaters, again, within reason. Christmas Day worship, we will be worshiping on Christmas Day, on Sunday, because it's Christmas and it falls on Sunday and we should worship on Christmas. It'll be our usual 930. We're going to be combining with Living Grace Church. and It'll be a, a low-key celebration of Jesus' birth. So much singing. So, with all of that fun, we're going to go back into worship and do a little more singing. Please stand and join singing together that boy child of Mary. 
go into prayer time now, and so we want to be focused on many things. Prayers for those still in healing, physical, emotional, and spiritual, especially this time of the year. That can be tough uh, for some folks. Prayers for those who have lost folks over the course of the year. Again, we want to keep them in our prayers. And if you know people who have lost someone, please, please keep them in your prayers. Keep them in your thoughts. Prayers for the children, the poor, the homeless across our nation. They're trying to do stuff for the homeless. Sometimes, sometimes they get it right and sometimes they don't. Right? But we have to believe and pray that long-term the situation of homelessness across our nation will be resolved. Prayers for our new bishop, Lynette Plombeck. Our continued prayers for healing for our district superintendent, Dan Johnson, and for the entirety of the United Methodist Church and the Church Universal. Prayer for unity within the United Methodist Church. Let us now confess our sins before God and one another, and we'll begin in silence. Let us pray. Lord, in the desert we find you. In all our struggles and in all our faults, we seek your goodness. Forgive us when we forget you. Forgive us when we forget our neighbors and do harm and not good towards them. Help us remember our baptism and to be grateful for it. Hear the good news. Grace has rescued us. We are not forgotten by God, but remembered and forgiven. This proves God's love for all of us. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And now in the confidence of being in right relationship with our God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we have a lot of things going on in our community. And first of all, I want to thank everyone for their generosity during this season. It has enabled us to feed people. It, has, it will enable us to reach out to the community uh, all over Bloomington this year, and we've been able to engage deeper than we ever have. One of the things that your tithes and offerings has enabled me to do is to become a member of a task force for Bloomington that focuses on welcoming people into Bloomington. And so as a result of that, we're going to be scheduling across Bloomington a series of events to try to include people who in the past have not been included. And so it's important that we give. It is important that we pray. It is important that we be involved in the community. And with that, let us bring our tithes and offerings. And as the ushers come forward with our gifts, please stand and sing together our offertory song, Emmanuel.
You may be seated. <laughs> in this time of Advent, it's a time of anticipation and getting ready. And we ask, is your heart prepared for a king? <laughs> Is the babe of whom we sing for to be our God and King? Is your heart prepared? Is your heart prepared? Is your heart prepared for a King? Our scripture reading today is from Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food consisted of locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is laying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, 
and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord. Peace. We hear that word and we envision something without conflict. Peace involves that, but there's so much more. Peace is a restored state of wholeness. The birth of Jesus announces the arrival of peace, and the death of Jesus creates peace with God. And when the angels proclaim peace on earth, the shepherds heard what our hearts long to hear, that God is indeed restoring all of it to his original and glorious purposes. So may we experience that kind of peace. It's an invitation for every person, and it's here now, because Jesus is here now. This is peace. Welcome to Christmas. Okay. All right, so we have a lot to cover today in a very short period of time, so we're going to get going with this. Now, quick lesson back into the Hebrew Bible so that Everyone's kind of caught up as to where we're at, right? So there's the first five books of the Bible called the Torah. There are the books of the prophets. There's the Psalms. And then as my, one of my professors would say, there's everything else. The Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they tell us of what God has done. The prophetic books tell us what God has said. And the Psalms are our response as humans to all of that. All of those books were written as a response to the destruction of the first temple and Israel being sent into exile and trying to make sense of that trauma that had happened to them. It goes back over and over again in that writing to it. Much of the writing in that period, in the period of the Hebrew Bible, we, well, we, not, as in other theologians, historians, and anthropologists, have written to being written during the period of the exile and shortly thereafter during the restoration. The New Testament repeats many of those same motifs. Remember, the Second Temple, well, actually, most of you probably don't know, the Second Temple was destroyed in 70 AD by Rome. Israel tried to regain their freedom. Rome said, how about no? And they came in and they destroyed the temple, carried off their elites and carried off the goods within the temple back to Rome. Rome erected triumphs with pictures of this that you can see in Rome should you wish to go. So the New Testament is a response not only to the crucifixion of Jesus, but is also a response to the destruction of the second temple. And what does that mean? We have lost our temple. We have lost Jesus. What now? And Matthew's quite interesting in this effect. Matthew is writing to everyone else. And we know that he's writing to everybody and everyone else because in the opening genealogy, he is writing, he has lists of great people. Some of them are, are sexually permissive. Some of them have murdered people. Some of them were great prophets. Some of them were saints. Some of them were sinners. Some of them were kings. Matthew's gospel is written 
for everybody. Because Jesus is here for everybody. Jew or Greek, Roman, and anyone in between. This week's reading brings us to John the Baptist, who in Matthew's gospel is cast as a prophet. We know that he's cast as a prophet because he says prophetic words. He announces that the kingdom of God is at hand. He refers back to Isaiah in 1st Isaiah, who makes reference to the fact that there is a Messiah coming, the anointed one, who will be the new Davidic king. Because in the Hebrew Bible, God promises David that his kingdom will reign forever. Which is kind of hard to see at this point, given that they are a territory of Rome. We know that John is a prophet also because he's wearing the prophet's uniform. Camel hair clothing, a belt of flesh around his waist. He's out away from the community so that he is casting, you know, kind of saying, hey, this is where the community is going. You have an option to change. And he eats locusts and wild honey. This is to tell you that he a prophet. The people that Matthew's writing to would know what a prophet is. They would know what an oracle is, but they wouldn't know what a prophet is. So Matthew has to explain it. As you read Matthew during the lectionary, you will see in Matthew that he does a lot of explaining. He assumes that you don't know anything about ancient Hebrew religion. John is predicting the arrival of a conquering power called the kingdom of God. The concept in Greek is referred to as basileia. God is forming an army to retake his land. Jesus is at the head of that army. All of us are members of that army. The kingdom of God is at hand. And we show up in places that need God. Places, you know, it could be a bar, it could be a strip club, it could be a place where they're selling drugs. We have shown up in places where crimes have been committed, genocides have been committed. We show up with the cross and we say the kingdom of God is here Stop what you're doing, turn, and follow God. John promoted baptism. Now, the concept of baptism isn't an odd concept to the people that he is baptizing. In Hebrew religion, there is this concept of the mikvah, the mikvah is a ritual bath. When you went up to Jerusalem, and you always went up to the high place at Jerusalem, as represented by our high place here in the sanctuary. You go up the stairs to the high place. You would go up the mountain to worship at the temple. But before you could do that, you had to be ritually pure. So there would be a series of baths where you could step in and immerse your entire body in cold, running, living water. You would come out of that water pure and ready to go up to worship. John is calling people out of the cities into the Jordan River to be baptized, to go into the water one final time for the forgiveness of their sins so that they can be forgiven and go on with their lives. And we know that this was appealing because both Pharisees and Sadducees went. And Pharisees and Sadducees hate each other. They're two rival parties. So clearly there was something about this experience of baptism that mattered. What is baptism? It's a sacrament. We do it with little babies. We confirm it when they complete, hopefully you know, when they're in their teenage years, they'll come back and confirm. But what is it? Baptism 
according to Wesley, is a final death. When you are baptized, that is the first and last time that you will die. From that point on, you have eternal life through Christ. You should have confidence that when you pass on, that you will go into eternity to be with God. You should have a confidence in that baptism. You should have a gratefulness for that baptism. It means that no matter what you do, God's hedge of protection is around you. Baptism would not have been an odd thing. The experience of the ritual bath is appealing to them because it is a redemption of their sins. And we know that because in Matthew verse 5, he talks about the people of uh, Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along with the Jordan, along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sin. Now, what's interesting about baptism is how we do it now. Babies can't confess their sins. They cry. But they don't have sins. Well, okay. Most babies may have committed a sin, but they didn't realize that they had committed a sin. Right? But we all, as adults, know exactly what sin is. Here is one of the things I want you to take away. Your baptism protects you. Your baptism puts a hedge of protection around you so that as you go out in the world as a you should not have to give in to the guilt and the frustration and the anger. You should always know that you can always come home. You are never so far away from God that you can't come home. You are never so locked in sin that you can't come home because the water of baptism protects you. Through baptism, we no longer die in our sins, but are forgiven and open to eternal life. It frees us in this life to live completely free of guilt and shame. We all will fall short. We all will sin. Sorry, only one guy got through life without it. But nothing can separate us from Christ when we are baptized. John the Baptist points to Jesus, who is literally coming as Messiah. And after this speech, we don't cover it in this with green, but Jesus shows up on the scene to be baptized. And John is like, whoa. All right. Why am I baptizing you? You should be baptizing me. And Jesus says, interestingly enough, we should do this anyhow because this is how it should be done. And it's not that Jesus needed to be baptized. Jesus was God wrapped in a squishy body. Jesus baptized himself so that you would all know how important it was that if, if it was important enough for Jesus to immerse himself in the baptismal font and waters, that it is important. That when Jesus goes to the table and celebrates communion with the disciples, it is important. When Jesus goes off to pray and to sit in silence and listen for God and sometimes to call out and wrestle with God, prayer was important to him. That's a hint that prayer is important to the life of the Christian. All of these things he does, modeling Christian righteousness, or how the Christian should live in their daily lives. Remember, the gospel is written to pagans 
Romans, Greeks, living far from the events that have passed, and they are about to be given the keys of eternal life through an invitation to baptism. God's rescue plan with Jesus coming out of the water is in effect. What's interesting is we don't, there's one key thing that the gospel writers never really say. They never say if when Jesus knew that he was the Son of God. I've always been curious as to what that is and when that is. We get hints, but the, the first thing is would God want to know that, would God want, when he put himself in Jesus, for Jesus to know that he is the son, that he's a piece of eternity. Who knows? I don't know. No idea. What we do know is when he came out of the water, he knew who he was. He knew his mission. He knew what he was called to do. God manifested the full power of eternity into him. So, we come to the other sacrament. The final sacrifice of God for our sins. Baptism and communion book in the lives of the believer. The Gospels are not for the dead, but for the living. What happens between birth and death matters. Your life isn't preparation for death because through baptism we have already died. Baptism is an empowerment for you to go into the world and to manifest the kingdom of God in the world. It is an empowerment. You are empowered to talk about your faith to others. You are empowered to pray over people for healing, and you should expect that they will, will be manifested in healing. We are all called to teach others who may not know who God is about who God is, what Jesus has done in your life. The gospel of our lives is written between sacraments. And praise God that we have the sacraments given as a gift. Amen? Let us go to the table. This is a final sacrifice, a confirmation of our baptism vows. The thing that saves us from our sins. Holy are you. And blessed is Jesus Christ who called you Abba, Father. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace the people as your own and fill them with a longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured out upon you us, your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night that Jesus gave himself up, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, all of you, this is my body, which is given for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance 
of me. After supper was finished, likewise, he took the chalice, and after praying over it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take this drink, all of you. This is my blood poured out for the new covenant for you and for everyone going forward for the remission of your sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Through him, in him, with him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours now and forevermore. Amen. If you haven't already, you may go ahead and partake of communion. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you, God, for the waters of baptism. Thank you, God, that you remind us during Advent of our baptism, and thank you, Lord, that we are grateful for it. But most importantly, Lord, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross for our sins, that all of our sins may be forgiven, Lord, that we may have eternal life in the boldness of to be soldiers in the army of the kingdom of God. We ask this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. We invite you to stand and sing together our closing hymn, He is Born the Holy Child. <laughs> benediction one thing there is there are some scam artists 
saying that I want you to send me a bunch of gift cards, that is not true. <laughs> it's a scam. It's, it's that time of the season. It's the time of season for gift giving. And it's the time of the year where scam artists try to take said gifts from us. So be mindful in your emails. Be mindful of your phones. <coughs> if in doubt, if it says that it comes from me or the church, call us. Find me. It's not us right now, okay? So protect yourselves. See me if you have questions on how to protect yourself, and then we'll go from there. So, may God's baptismal waters continue to drench you, to protect you, to surround you with a hedge of protection from those forces in the world that may want to harm you. But may they also give you peace of mind, knowing that you know who and whose you are. In the name of the risen Christ, amen.